But what we try to do is create a culture where people understand that it's much better to try, right? And it's much better to take the risk, to try and aim high, even if you get it wrong, than it is to not try at all. And I think it's so easy in all businesses, and particularly in these businesses, to say no to things. It's, you know, it's so easy to just play it safe. But really, the great successes come from when you're taking those bigger risks. Um, and you know, we see that certainly creatively as well as commercially. Um, and it's really important to have a culture where a firm doesn't get traumatized by the things it gets wrong. You, know, you can see large companies really become um, incredibly risk averse, incredibly slow, possibly over analytical. We, you know, we like to have a place where people can come and feel like they're going to be backed to take those risks. And uh, you know, sometimes we get there and some pockets of the company aren't, you know, are too risk averse and we have to fix that because it's a pretty sprawling business. Have you taken a big risk lately? Well, I think all of our business is risk, but I guess you know, once I was talking to an investor and he was talking about the difference between buying risk and selling risk. He was saying that you know buying risk generally is you know tricky, but you generally will get a better return. I think we like to look at a competitive landscape that you know you know where you might have strong incumbents in a place, but we like to look at a place where we think we can do something very different, where we think we can change. And sometimes you, know, you will get that wrong. You know we're investing an enormous amount right now um, in original programming. Um, you know, and that's delaying some profit for us, right? So our original programming investments, for example, in cable television in the U.S. have grown enormously over the last number of years, particularly at FX and FXX. Um, that's a risk. Uh, you know, we put out, you know, when we acquired, we made The Simpsons, but then we acquired it for cable syndication in the U.S. recently um, in a competitive auction with a bunch of other players. And we paid, you know, an enormous, uh, an enormous sum for the entire library, and we're making 100% of it available on an authenticated basis online. Um, we're very excited about that, but we don't really know how customers are going to react. We think they're going to love it. Um, 550 episodes and growing, you know, all tagged and you know, searchable and packaged every which way. Um, but that was, you know, that was risky. When we launched The Simpsons on FXX, we played all 550 episodes in sequence over the course of, I think it was 12 days. And um, who knew that was gonna work? But actually it worked brilliantly. And actually, you know, John Landgraf and Chuck Stabler and, and, and Stephanie Gibbons to FX were just brilliant in how they put this together. These are the sorts of risks that you have to take where you're doing something different than might have otherwise been seen. And we'll continue, we'll continue to do it. We're, we're, I love it when I see, I, 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 you know, I love the moment in the business where you sort of go, holy cow, I can't believe we did that or tried to do that, um, as opposed to sort of being one of the mill. I like to be surprised, and I try to surprise my colleagues as well by, you know, sort of you know, aiming pretty high for that. When there was these reports of big bids for other media companies in the summer, one thing that surprised me was that you were bidding for media companies, not technology companies. Well, isn't, isn't this become a game where technology companies are increasingly in the seat? I, you know, I don't think so, actually. Look, we're in different businesses somewhat, and we work very closely with, you know, with Facebook in particular, actually, on, on, on a lot of initiatives. Um, but we, you know, I think that for us as a, as, a, as, a, as a creative business, you know, we find that, you know, I think we want to continue to grow what we have. We actually really like the assets we have. We think we're pretty well positioned. We've changed a lot of our business over the last few years. We try to create, and we've tried to create over the last few years, Big, bigger things, fewer things, um, and I was discussing with David, I said, we try to think about, you know, in success, what's a project that's fundamentally going to change our lives over 10 years, right? So, you know, if we can, you know, continue to innovate and continue to lead in India, where we're the number one broadcaster today, um, over 10 years, that is going to change our lives. If Sky Europe can be as great as it can be, that is going to change our lives. Um, you know, these are the things that, you know, we try to, we, we want to go and do. And I think in the structure of the business, I mentioned before about the value of programming, copyrights going up, I think that's going to continue to be the case. I think there's an incredible shift going on um, in the business where you're really shifting value from you know, a downstream margin to upstream creators because the competition for to be differentiated, to be genuinely meaningful to customers and viewers is so intense that that investment needs to be made. Um, and we think we benefit from that, from being, you know, really a leading, we'd like to be, you know, we aspire to be the leading 
the best creative company in the world. But isn't, um, isn't the big fundamental shift that's happening at the moment that the millennials are going onto YouTube and other online video sources, they're snacking, they're not going to become the customers for the fixed monthly satellite bill? Yeah, well, I think it's really important not to believe that business rules are static. Right? So there's absolutely no question that we live today in an environment of essentially what I think, I think, it, was, I think it was Michael Powell at the FCC years ago, they were, he referred to as ultimate plurality, right? This notion that everything is available that was ever made to anyone everywhere, right? And that's really driven by connectivity. It's driven by the economics of the cloud. It was being driven to some extent by the cost of storage locally. People have huge hard drives in their homes for very little money. Now it's really about the cloud. And I think, you know, I think that's an enormously exciting time for customers. Now what that means is the competitive set that we all operate in is vastly larger than it's ever been before. It's incredibly, talking about before, just the creative diversity here at Midcom, you know, when you walk around the floor as I did this morning downstairs and see, you know, from everywhere around the world, so many new ideas, so many, so much competition for each other uh, to, to go and do this. But it's not good enough to just compete with each other when well, we have this here in Midcom. Today, in an environment of ultimate plurality, where I can have vast libraries at my disposal as a customer, um, if you make a new TV show, you're competing really with every TV show that's ever been made before. Um, it's incredibly challenging. Now, I think that's enormously exciting for customers. And I think creatively, what we're seeing around the world is some of the most incredible, sort of, really an incredible revolution in quality uh, that's coming through. And I think customers are responding to it. So if I look at the way that people are consuming dramatic series, for example, um, they are time shifting them, there's no question. They're consuming them on platforms that are, have to date been more challenging to monetize. I hate that word, but that's you know, to do that. Um, but generally speaking, that part of the business, the streamed business, point to point, should be a much better business for creators and for us as well. But once so, you're, so you're right that the thing is shifting, but I think you're going to see things break down in a surprising way. It's not going to be about everything being totally atomized out of part. Customers generally like bundling because bundling drives down prices and drives consumption up. But a Netflix is just a bundle of on-demand programming there. And actually, people really like paying a monthly subscription if it's reasonable and they get a good quality service. A Hulu Plus is like that. If I look at the Sky businesses, right, which have been providing TV Everywhere services on multiple platforms for a number of years. We started really in 2004, I think, distributing Sky to um, uh, computer laptops, pre, you know, tablets. And um, that's been enormously popular, and it's why the Sky businesses have continued to grow, and amongst the multiple demographics as well. Um, so I think, you know, I think subscription pricing, people will bundle things in different ways for sure, and the stack will kind of get reordered. But I don't think it's so, it's as much to say, listen, there are these technology companies, YouTube's out there, you know, subscription television is dead. I think subscription television is alive and kicking but it's changing and it's being driven by a competitive dynamic that is, you know, I think, I, I think an enormous opportunity and pretty exciting. But while you're spending tens of millions of dollars on a high quality drama series, the guy in Yeah, look, I think it's really interesting when you look at the diversity of programming that's out there. We were talking earlier about these like unboxing videos and stuff. Um, you know, people will watch a lot of stuff. You know, customers, customers are always, and they should, you know, they should always surprise us. And I always say to people, you know, you should never, to never overestimate the customer's satisfaction with the status quo. And the diversity they, that they can find online from GoPro or PewDiePie or whatever it is, right, um, is, is, is there and will occupy a large amount of time and consumption. But that said, we see new online um, you know, video companies. Um, we're, we're an investor in one called Vice Media. Um, and we're seeing millennials, we're a small investor, we're seeing millennials there, you know, engaging in long format news programming. Um, we're seeing them engaging in long format, you know, music and entertainment programming. It happens to be online. It happens to be a different kind of advertising model that is out there. But it is ultimately a quality video business that has, you know, created an authentic connection with its customers. And that's really our challenge everywhere. And everyone storytelling is how do we create that authenticity and how do we really connect with those viewers? And I think, um, you know, I think actually in large parts of the business, 
and the industry globally, I think it's actually been a, it's a very successful time right now. And customers are being better served than they ever have by what's available to them and the manner in which it's available. Let's look five years ahead and have the spread of malicious networks and Google Responds is doing more than any other company almost to fight illegal online content. Um, who's right? Uh, I don't know if I really want to get into that today right now. I think there's no question that they can do more, a lot more. Um, um, so certainly Google is not right in saying that they're doing more than anyone. Um, that just isn't true. I think the, you know, I think the real issue here in privacy is, and you really have to, but, you know, the problem with, with, with Google, but let's not personalize around, the problem with search-driven kind of discovery, uh, there is that once, you know, if the content is there and it's illegal and you're just selling clicks, right, as an advertiser, as a big ad network, you have every incentive for all of that illegal programming to be there. So you may be slow, you may say, send me a letter about it if you see an infraction or whatever it is. And I think that's fundamentally not really good enough. I think, you know, this, you know, copyright is the, is the, is the font of innovation on a scale of the last, you know, whenever it was in the 15th century, what did the Statue of Anne, you remember, um, that, uh, that sort of in, in thri in, enshrined copyright as really author's rights, as the, as, the, as the ability of an author and a creator to, you know, feed himself. And, uh, and now this is an industry there are hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of jobs around the world that one way or another benefit from the copyright business, our business, uh, uh, and, 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 and music and other forms of copyright. Um, and I think it's really important, and it's important for um, governments to take it very seriously, it's important for regulators to take it very seriously, and it's very, very important for you know, infringers um, to you know, be taken seriously, and those who turn a blind eye or enable infringement to be, you know, to be held accountable. But that's as far as I go on that, but it is a big problem. I hope to your question before about you know availability or windows, one of the key things we need to do as well is make sure that we're making product available to customers in as easy a way as possible so as to disincentivize piracy at the kind of customer level as much as possible. And that's something that we have to do and we have to innovate around to make sure that we're not creating this problem in part um, by ourselves. So Amazon is now making programming and Netflix. I mean, we sell programming and create programming for Amazon um, and Netflix. Um, and they've done, you know, I would say particularly, we don't know any of Amazon's numbers, it's a little bit of a black box over there. Um, but I think, you know, Netflix has obviously done you know, tremendously well and has really created a, you know, category out there um, that customers clearly love. Um, and as they invest in more programming, that programming can be competitive with ours. But we also continue to pardon me, continue to supply programming um, to, 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 to Netflix. And that will ebb and flow. We also supply to Google Plus as we sell to our partners at HBO for exploitation both on HBO as well as HBO Go or to the Sky businesses. I think, you know, the business is not so much a zero-sum game as some people might see it from the outside. It's a more nuanced business than that. And what we need to do is make, we need to make the careful decisions that, you know, we're exploiting, um, the, the product that we have in, in, as, in, in, as, in, 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 in as robust a way as possible and really therefore creating an environment where new storytellers know that they're going to be looked after, right? Know that their product is going to be, you know, we're going to be commercial about it, we're going to sell it, we're going to do well for them, and we're also going to get the widest possible audience um, for what they're doing. And, you know, that's, the, that's how we have to manage it as opposed to just saying, you know, X company is the enemy. You know, these businesses are too diverse um, to, uh, to you know, have hard and fast rules around that. We have too many interactions with our partners around the industry, even when we're competing with them somewhere else. Seeing your role in a company going through a complex time, what did you personally take out of that to be a better leader? Well, I think, um, you know, it's really interesting, and I'm sure many people in this room, you know, you go through periods of, um, you know, where you're, you know, you, maybe you're more high profile than you would have chosen. Uh, and, you know, or you're being attacked for something, or, you know, you know the company can genu genuinely be in, you know, in, in crisis. And that can be driven by the press, it can be driven by politics, it can be driven by genuine failures, all those things. I think the main thing that I look at is actually, you know, we were talking about it the other day, the, um, I think, I think you try to run, A, that you have to lead through those things that all of your colleagues are going through the same thing that you are, even though you may be more high profile, as a boss, whatever it is. Um, but you have to meet people through those things. 
and you have to really enable them also to help you. Um, and that's something that's, that's something that's hard to do, but you, know, you really find real strength in the organization when you go through and you stress it, right? When it gets tested like that. Um, and strengthen individuals. And I also think that, you know, one quality that is, you know, often underrated, I think, is just sheer perseverance. Um, and knowing that you, you know, you, you, you can get through things. If you keep, you know, I think Winston, I think it was Winston Churchill, it's a bad habit. It's a bad habit to get into, which I'm not into, of quoting Winston Churchill, but I'll do it, I'm probably get it wrong. I think he said, when you're going through hell, keep moving. Uh, and I, I, I think that's really true. <laughs> and um, you, you know, perseverance is everything. We were talking earlier about this thing called the marshmallow test, where they put two, a marshmallow in front of, like, is it a two-year-old or a three-year-old, a tiny child? Uh, and they shut the door of the room, and they have video cameras. And they say, if you, if you eat the marshmallow, um, if, you don't, if you don't eat the marshmallow, you'll get another marshmallow when I come back in the room in two minutes, or whatever it is, right? And then they shut the door, and the child contemplates the marshmallow, and the child might smell the marshmallow, a child might lick the marshmallow, try to take a tiny bite, some just eat it immediately. Um, but the child that gets through it, it's one of the single best indicators of future success, is if you can leave, if the small child can leave the two marshmallows uh, and not get through it, and actually it's just in Wired Magazine the other day, so which body an issue. Um, the, uh, but it's, it's a really, um, it's, I think it's true, and fundamentally it's about willpower, and it's about the strength of will and character, and, uh, and, 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 and will is everything. Last question. Five years' time, which of the emerging technologies, we've got Oculus Rift, virtual reality, we've got new kinds of 3D, which of these technologies is going to make an impact on how people here are making and also consuming programming? Well, I think, you know, I, I think from a standpoint of, of, of making and storytelling, I think it's, it's, it's enormously exciting, you know, particularly some of these, you know, we've seen a development in 3D um, at the very high end, really being excellent. Um, this Oculus Rift or virtual reality type thing, which obviously there's applications around gaming and things like that. But fundamentally, I think there's a there's a, there's a class of storytelling that's benefiting from this this technology, and the trajectory is towards immersion, right? The tra trajectory is toward entertainments that are indistinguishable from reality at some point, and I see that very clearly. That we're on that path. Um, it will not be appropriate for every kind of storytelling. It will not be appropriate for every type of use case, you know, on a tablet, on a phone, or whatever it is. But for certain types of storytelling, it will really enable, it will be the most extraordinary kind of, uh, and, I think, um, and I think those sorts of entertainments are, are clearly, we can, we can now visibly see how you get there, and it's not science fiction. Um, and then the other trend is about connectivity. It's what we talked about before, and connectivity around the world, and that really means that ultimate plurality um, will arrive. And when that arrives, it means that, you know, we have to rethink competition law in these areas. We have to think about how we manage windows and all those sorts of things, how we actually, what the business rules are around our whole kind of industry. These are business rules that, generally speaking, were created with a lot of innovation, but not that much. Um, you know, in kind of the 70s and 80s, around the technical infrastructure to deliver programming because that was the best way to do it. Um, we need to be pace setters, and we can be pace setters in terms of defining the business rules that are going to result in both the best products for our customers, and the greatest storytelling, as well as be the best business for us. And that's, that's our aspiration and our challenge.